Hi, my name is Mike Chart. I'm the director with the Boulder Office of Disaster Management. We appreciate you being here, Mike. Thank you, sir. I guess the first question, let's start with this. What happened that day, the day of the Marshall Fire, mm -hmm. and why weren't people notified? Well, I can speak to the emergency alert. There's a couple of different layers to this. Uh, a lot of folks said they didn't get a notification. There's reasons for that. One is we, at the time of the fire, did not have our wireless emergency alert capability implemented. Uh, people weren't signed up in our emergency tele, uh, telephone warning system called Everbridge. And those are the main two reasons I can think of. But um, from the wi uh, wireless side... Um, Which is called IPAWS, right? It's, it's part of a system through FEMA. Thank you. It's wireless emergency alerts is what people get on their phone, similar to an AMBER alert. Gotcha. IPAWS stands for Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. It's a system that FEMA offers, and uh, local communities can apply to get access into the system to be able to do alerts with no weather radio, EAS, and also the wireless emergency capabilities people have in their phones. Okay. So should it have been implemented prior um, to that day? It's a fair question. Uh, I wish we had it for sure, but we were working on it. Uh, like uh, We will have this implemented uh, in March uh, and April of 2022 this year, so it's, it's a few months away. We've been working on it prior to this. Uh, we started our application process for this capability on, uh, I believe it was May or April of 2019. And that seems so far back, but when you look at the story of there of how we got to where we are today, um, you know, you can understand why we are where we are. So the first year of this was spent getting the application done, getting the key codes to be able to have access to the WIA software, which is every proprietary emergency notification system has a tack on or an add on feature to this. They then basically load that in. It took a couple of months, it was about November when we finally had everything set up and we were able to have access to look into there and find out how to use the system. Um, Boulder, we used to be the Office of Emergency Management. We changed our name a bit. Uh, that's another story perhaps, not for here, but. Uh, Office what, of Disaster Management Yeah, now? that's what we are now. Okay. Um, the reason behind, uh, you know, once you get into it and you're starting to look at it, um, is you have to then uh, see how, what's the best place to put this? Where can it be effective? Our office, as the applicant holder, we become the collaborative operational group um, authority. Our job is to make sure that the use of the system is conducted properly per the standards of IPAWS. It's to make sure that there's policies, procedures, training, uh, that after action reports are done, if the system is used, and we become the administrative element over the system to the different places where IPAWS or the WIA specifically can operate from. We have determined that that would be best in an alert and warning center or a 911 center. Our office is not 24 seven. There's four emergency managers and administrative officer. So we're not here around the clock. So it needs to be someplace where you can have 24 seven coverage and interfacing with the first responders that are out there making calls for evacuate that neighborhood or this city. So the process is there. Um, we have been working in that administrative element and we also have to make sure the system's tested and we've been doing that since we received approval to do it so that if the 911 center were to use it, uh, they're able to operate it. We took it right to our 911 centers um, early 2020 uh, before the COVID uh, occurred, uh, a COVID uh, pandemic occurred and the dispatch centers were like, we'd love to do it. We just don't have the capacity right now. Uh, the story, another story that a lot of people don't realize is that 911 centers across the country are struggling with retention and turnover. And on top of COVID and these sort of things is reducing capacity uh, to, you know, to be able to take new things on. And that's what happened here. Um, and I've heard you say that also Boulder has faced a number of disasters exactly. since you uh, inherited, implemented this system. It did. And so you've been delayed because of those? Exactly, uh, Russell. So I had no idea we would be experiencing the year we were in 2020. When you think of the, the 18 months that were as ahead of us when we started, without a doubt, um, major impacts on our office, our communities, um, and our resources. We started off with the COVID response. We were supporting that and then having to take some lead roles on that. And that we were in an incident command response structure up until early June and it still didn't stop. We were in a lighter format, but we were still supporting that. We had to support uh, a local cyber attack that was taking out a water system for a couple weeks. 
had a little bit of break there, but we're still supporting COVID. We're helping with vaccination or the uh, um, testing sites. And then there was an outbreak that we had to go back into a command structure on for another seven weeks. And during that time- At CU Boulder. CU Boulder and, and the city of Boulder and across the county for that fact. Uh, and then- And then you had fire, then had you fire. had shootings. Yeah, Calwood fire in October. That created a burn scar for flooding uh, where we had re uh, three, 400 residents that had no early warning detection because when burn scars hit, they cause flash flooding and debris flows. So we had to create a whole new system out of our office to help support that um, public safety need in that part of the county. Uh, and that took us into April. And at the same time, we get the Boulder shooting and we're responding to that. So these are all impacts on our, on our comm centers. During that year, we also were able to uh, standardize our template formats and our terminology and work on bringing the communication centers or our 911 dispatch centers into a standardized way that they were processing alert and warnings. And there was some work in the mountains because we see our, our mountain fire risk pretty, pretty heavy like we do um, elsewhere, but creating polygons for alert and warning throughout the mountain areas, especially with the Calwood. And we did that and had that system ready to go by the time Calwood, it was just, it's, you know, the sequencing of things. And that system was very effective in alert and warning of people that uh, were involved in the Calwood fire. That was a fast moving wind driven fire too. So mm -hmm. a lot of work has gone on around alert and warning, but the WIA piece, it needed to be in 911. It's not just you flip a switch and then people start launching this. And that's what we've been working on for the last few years. And WIA and again is wireless, wireless emergency, emergency alert. Correct. So an alert that will go to your phone. So yes. what about those who will watch this interview and say, you can't blame other disasters for not having this piece implemented. Yeah. Is that a fair question, Mike? And Absolutely. Well, why wasn't it? Yeah, it's a fair question and it's about capacity. Um, as the uh, alert, or the, the uh, WIA authority to try to get this in place, it requires that collaboration. That's why it's a collaboration operational group. You need people that are controlling 911 centers and other pieces to be able to have the capacity to be able to take this on. So that's a piece with the dispatching capacity. You're running disasters or you can't sit here and build a new capability while you're trying to take care of all the life safety issues in our county. Mm. Those are substantial reasons why there were delays built in over the, over the 2020 year and into 2021. And about mid year, we actually started seeing some COVID restrictions lift. We didn't have any more disasters. We were able to get out of that profile of response and recovery and preparedness that we have. And we were able to then put some effort back into the wireless emergency alert and the dispatch centers were picking up some capacity that at that time they were able to then embrace what it took to be able to get this stuff moved forward. When it is implemented and yep. you're saying April of this year, mm -hmm. what will it do? How will it Im impact people's lives? Yeah. Will it be an alert that goes right to their phone? And how do you determine who is alerted in a situation like this? Fair question. So. The process would be that the 911 centers are gonna have this in there. When an incident happens, the first responders are gonna be able to get there, do their size up. They'll be able to make the request for emergency uh, alerts and there'll be warnings and orders going out. And then they can be directly tied into the 911 center and they will have the access side by side with both systems to be able to create the Everbridge alert or warning in that system to pick up the landlines, the opt in numbers and launch that alert. The WIA will then go out shortly thereafter or pretty close to simultaneously then taking the information that is being constructed in that side of the system and applying it to the WIA system to make sure that those two messages or warnings or orders that are going out are consistent and they're able to complement one another so we don't send out confusing warning information to the community. Because what's the risk? I mean, uh, you were explaining this off camera a moment ago, but with the WIA or the iPods, there is a risk factor to alerting too many people and bottlenecking, you know, the roads so I in think, an evacuation in yeah. an evacuation situation, right? There is, but I think alerting, we have to do, use right definitions. What does alerting mean? What, is a, what does an order mean, an evacuation order? Two different things. Gotcha. If we're doing an amber alert, a flash flood warning or alert, those are things that are making you aware of something, taking action, that's something about Go to your, go climb to the top floor, climb to the basement, look out for a vehicle that was involved in some sort of uh, law enforcement custody issue. But we get into the evacuation environment. Now we're asking people to take action and leave. And that's where this becomes different than alerting. Now we're talking about an evacuation order. We're physically needing to put people on the roads and get them away from the hazard. So if here's the fire and you're here, 
The goal is to give you an evacuation order in sufficient time to be able to get you, not pack everything up at this point, but get life safety away from the hazard as quickly as possible. And there needs to be space for people to go towards to get away from here. Mm. If everyone is evacuating at the exact same time, and sometimes that's gonna happen because the area needs to be very large, but they're at the risk. If there's no space to push people, everyone gets blocked right here as this hazard's moving into them. Mm. And that becomes a potential problem here. Also, if everyone's- So it, it almost has to be more targeted and more um, time-coded, like, yeah. you, you know, superior, you evacuate now, or this- Ideally, superior, yes. You evacuate now, and then 15 minutes later, okay, now, yep. now we go with this group. Correct. Can you do that? That is the goal. The circumstances under normal conditions or even more adverse conditions, I would say yes. You put a 107 mile an hour wind, a category two hurricane gust and sustains in the 40 to 60 mile range, that becomes an issue. Mm. So this is the challenge of this. But the other effects of this, of the over alerting, so to speak, or I should say over evacuating, not alerting, over evacuating is now roads are blocked, fire trucks can't get in to defend structures or help with the uh, evacuation and law enforcement cannot get in to go door to door because they're being delayed and caught up in traffic jams. Mm. So these are some of the consequences that are, have to be thought out. Not making excuse of why the, the whole story begins with everyone deserves to get, and rightfully so, should get an evacuation order. Mm. Regardless of what phone you have, whether you're opted in, whether you're in a landline, that's our goal here in Boulder County. It will be after this system, it has been before. Um, and that's what we're driving towards. Um, so with so that in mind, was this emergency a failure? or was it a success? Yeah. Two people did lose their lives. Absolutely. And there must be regrets for that. Absolutely, so success or failure, I'd like to say we're fortunate. Time of day, nighttime evacuations always go worse than a daytime evacuation. Um, anytime you have a loss of life, you can't say it's a success. Um, so I would say that we're fortunate that the death toll and heavy casualties were not higher. And that's something we'll look at as to how or why that happened, um, but that's how I'd rate it. We're fortunate um, in the work that was done. Um, there are obviously people didn't get an alert and that's very well documented. Um, I'm sorry that experience happened. We are, have been working on it. We are working on it. We will make sure that every available technology we have is gonna be in place. And it just was not at the time of this incident for circumstances that were beyond uh, our control to some extent. Uh, it's not an excuse, it's just explaining the story of why we're here where we are. Um, and so that's where, where, where that sits. Um, we will get people, as best we can, an evacuation order. And even with that, if we have wi wireless emergency alerts in place with our Everbridge, it will never be 100%. And let's we'll clarify that point for our mm -hmm. viewers, that we're talking about two different systems here. Um, iPods will go to every phone from that's within a certain um, area of a tower, right? Right. And then you have Everbridge, which is sort of a system that that a, an individual wireless uh, subscriber will s subscribe to that, and then Everbridge knows where they're they're located. Yeah, it's located by address. Okay. So it's much more precise with the Everbridge system. So it helps you in achieving, as you asked earlier, you know that coordinated, timely ability to kind of manage that. The wireless side, if it's 3.0 version wireless, wireless emergency alerts, it is supposed to function similar to that Everbridge system, which is geofencing all the phones that have 3.0 in it. If they're in that area, they will get it and it won't bleed over. Mm. But remember, that's 30, about 38% of the phones that are currently in the consumer's hands. Explain geofencing to the So if I were to say that this piece of paper was a polygon, it's a shape that we lay down over a neighborhood, Anything in that boundary line is gonna get that evacuation order. Gotcha. The wireless emergency alerts that are in that area are gonna be the same. It's gonna be just like this. So all those phones that have wireless emergency alerts are gonna get this. Even if you're visiting. Even if you're visiting, and that's the advantage of this system. With a 2.0 or 1.0 WIA or wireless emergency alert, phones are gonna get this all around this polygon because you're gonna pick up towers that are located here, here, and here and then you're picking up the transmission area of those towers. This could bounce 10 miles from the original polygon that we set up. Which is why if you're sitting in a restaurant with a bunch of strangers and there's an Amber Alert that goes out, you all get, your, the phones all, phones all blow up. up at That's the same correct. time. That's correct. That's a statewide alert. 
So, and that's, so the alert thing, yes, alerts can go large. If they go to Kansas, we don't care. We're not trying to be precise in that area. And if, like I said, in a flash flooding or a tornado or an active shooter even, if you send out that alert and it blasts all over to the metro area and alerts 300,000 people, I don't care because people are inconvenienced, but at least people are aware. Mm. And in this fire, we want people to be alert of the fire, but that's that balance mm -hmm. of how do you get as many people alert to what's going on, but now we put the evacuation in there and that adds some complexity to it and some coordination and it requires a very strong command and control capability with the first responders to be able to know where the fire or what's happening, be able to locate your resources in those neighborhoods to defend with fire trucks in this case, and then more importantly, getting law enforcement and fire personnel to go door to door, because regardless of all this, if you don't have that door to door, hundreds of lives will be lost. And you saw heroic efforts during this. Just to drive the evacuation point home, um, if, you, if you inadvertently evacuate an area too large and the, where the threat maybe doesn't exist, um, you could have what? chaos, you could have a second disaster with people getting bottlenecked and not being able to get out? Yeah, so if we go too big, there's fun, we call it funnel time. So the transportation system can only carry so much. So you're trying to you know, make sure that you get as many people away as you can. And first responders necessarily aren't thinking about it. They're thinking about what area do I need to get away from the hazard. That's where their mindset is. But if you, that's the consequence, right? They're knowing that this is the polygon that I have and they can kind of then locate resources to try to keep traffic flow going. But if you're blasting it out to a larger community side, you're getting all this other dumping of, of people that maybe are gonna be at risk in two hours or three hours, but not in the first hour. So that's the strategy or intention behind that is to try to make sure that your evacuations are ensuring also that the people that get that evacuation order have a way to safely leave. That's the other responsibility here too. It's also, we have to alert as many people in this area as we can and that's a responsibility that the first responders now one center has and as the disaster manager, we're, we're, we have to balance. But we also have an obligation for those people that are in that polygon area to make sure that they are able to get away mm. and get far from the hazard. So that's the balance we have. And obviously without the wireless emergency alerts, we're not able to hit, a lot of folks don't have landlines. So, and we saw this back in 2019 is why we went after this application in the first place is because we saw this. Now we could have sat on this and done nothing because we knew that we didn't have the capacity to do it as a dispatch center and there's probably other counties that don't have WIAs out there or their capability. But people think you did sit on it and do nothing. What yeah. do you say to them? You were, you were actively working on it the whole time? Uh, during the, from the time that we got the license? Yeah. So, and, and we got the license in 2019. The effort was about getting the license in place, getting to understand the wireless emergency alert capability in Everbridge. And then we had the disasters. And that took us off our, off our ability to, per, to propel towards getting this implemented. We came out in the middle of 2021, about August, and we have been working since that time uh, to try to get this in place. Mm -hmm. And we've been working since that time. So like we haven't been sitting on doing nothing. We've been responding and building other systems for other residents in our community that were under direct threat and doing things that are part of our disaster management focus. So yeah. it's not that we just sat on this and did nothing. We were, we were doing many things to serve our community's public safety needs. Do you feel under fire for this? Um, you know, you told me on the phone um, that you're, you're not defensive about this because you feel like you've been transparent as an agency mm -hmm. yep. all along Absolutely. Um, from the time that you took this job. Mm -hmm. um, do you still feel that way and do you, do you, I don't know, do you think some of the criticism is fair in this case? When you're in this job, there's gonna be criticism and it's well placed, we listen to that. That's part of feedback from your community. You have to be open to that and hear what they're saying and then take action on it to, to make the, the changes that are there and, the, and meet the expectations of the community. So I don't take that criticism as, as like I'm defensive about it, I, I'm open to it. And that's why we're committed and have been committed to getting this done going back to 2019 is we knew this is something that was gonna be needed in our arsenal of ways to warn the, the community. And we've been working on that. Um, so no, I'm not defensive around that. As far as the other way the story's portrayed, that's just the way it is. You know, maybe the next time this will work out okay. And we'll have a different story around this because we're using this, we have it. But how about how the there. story is reported? Um, you that, know, you told me that that sometimes isn't always, that, isn't always the um, best picture of what is going on in this office. Sure. 
Well, that's for the news. I'm not here to control the news. The news can do whatever they want and how they report it, as you can. Um, what I'm doing is trying to get this out here so people understand the message of what is going on in the office. It's more important that that, that is there, that people know that this is going to be in play uh, here very soon, that we have been working on it, because uh, that's the story, um, and that we are going to have a better capability to alert and warn and evacuate our residents. And uh, unfortunately, we did not have it at the time of this fire. And the story is why we didn't. I've, I've told it to many different news outlets, and it is what it is. It, um, what about the sirens? Um, yeah. And, you know, I've, I've read that those um, have six settings. Yep. Wildfire isn't one of them. Um, will those be rebooted and readdressed, or do they need to be? So that's the question we'll have with the local communities. Uh, we pull this apart and do the AR and say, you know, do you want to add or look at changing that? Um, and see if they do. And if that's the case, then, our, you know, we'll do that. Our job is to uh, make sure the sirens work. Make when sure do the sirens go off? They go off basically f uh, what type of hazards yes. or what the type of hazards are going to be severe storms. That would be like lightning or heavy hail. Uh, there will be flash flooding, tornado. There is a, a, a setting in there for canceling the siren once it starts up, a test, and then for hazardous materials because, it, you know, you have railways and the, and the highway. So that's, I believe, why that was chosen that way. Gotcha. Um, so there is the opportunity to, to look at that and then make some investments in changing that siren package up if that's what... And add doing. wildfires. We could add something but take something away is where it sits. So we'll wow. have to look at that and see what the community would like, the community leaders would like to do. Is it, is it fair to say that this situation was unprecedented, that no one saw anything like this coming? Or are you prepared for this kind of thing? Um, from, uh, from our perspective, I guess, as a community, it seems mm -hmm. like a disaster that no one ha ha could have ever foreseen, but maybe yeah. you did. So we build towards in our office. So part of this is our office is in the EOC. We're about consequence management. What that means is everything that's going on on the first responder side, we're reacting to. So the example is if they call for all the evacuations, our job is not to send the evacuations out. Our job is to get the shelters opened up and make sure we're moving people from evacuation sites to shelters and, and get them you know, the, the, uh, the care and the resources they need. We apply that, we call it all risk, all hazards. So why we maybe can't anticipate everything that's gonna happen from an occurrence perspective, we are able to take all our capabilities and apply them to a mass shooting, to a flash flood of 2013, to a wildfire of Calwood, and then this urbanized fire here. We were using the very same capabilities that uh, on this fire we're using in others and they perform very well. Mm -hmm. So I guess the answer to your question is the, the responsibility we have is to make sure we have an all hazards, all risk system and we can provide those, those uh, capabilities uh, to any hazard that hits regardless of what it may be. And now we know in Colorado, unfortunately, that grass fires can cause catastrophic loss as well, That's right? Correct. Because this was not a forest fire. This was a grass fire, and there's a difference, right? Yeah, You're I, talking about wildland urban interface yeah. earlier, wooey mm -hmm. versus gooey, I guess. Yeah, right, grassland urban interface. I think there's a new way to look at this risk profile along the front range here in Colorado. I think traditionally we get locked into to that. Um, it's not forested timber burning into a city like in, let's say, mountain communities or communities that are right up against the Waldo wildland. Waldo Canyon, even. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now we're talking about this sort of removed sort of urban corridor with grasslands around it. And I think that changes uh, how we need to view that risk and the capabilities that we need to have from a response side to be able to, to deal with that kind of uh, you know, disaster. Not to diminish the loss of life in this case, Mike, but were there successes um, in this? I mean, yep. we were able to evacuate thousands of people safely. Yeah, about 30, I, what I've been, I had to look at the numbers, but Around 35,000 people were moved either by their own action or through the existing systems we had or through first responders. So you look at the work that the men and women of the fire and law, and law enforcement agencies had done to evacuate folks, that's a, that's a success story and I think some of the camera footage out there shows that. Um, there's also things that happen, evacuating a hospital, some long-term care facilities. To have that happen without an injury or a death speaks to the preparedness work that was going on in the hospitals. We were able, to, out of our center, be able to support them with transportation resources to be able to move those patients away uh, from the risk and get them to safety. Um, so there's a lot of other stories here 
in this disaster. And, and uh, so, you know, those are things that shouldn't wash away the problems. You know, that's what we don't do. We don't steer away from our problems here. We're gonna look at these things. We're gonna find out where we had our successes. We're gonna find out where our weaknesses in our system, and then we're gonna go fix them. And uh, the WIA, obviously, we've heard loud and clear, and we know, but we've the been working on wants it. it. They do, and, and they're gonna have it, and we've been working towards that. Put and a punctuation point on that. When will they get it? They're gonna uh, have it uh, by March 3rd as the City of Boulder's the 911 Center. There when I'll be doing the uh, final orientation tabletop workshop to make sure that all the operational elements are, are tied together, they understand how to use this, um, and they've completed all their requirements as the COG authority for uh, the IPAWS in the county. And then the next piece would be the county's following up very closely, so my, our 911 dispatch center for the county, for the Sheriff's Department, will go in April. So we will have it, if not earlier. So that, that's our time frame, and that coincides uh, with what we normally traditionally see as our flood season, where we try to have all our preparedness work, all our adjustments to our alert and warning systems and everything done by April 1. We start doing our siren testing program at that time, um, and everything just lines up around that. So uh, that was our intent back in sort of August of 21 was to make sure that we had this implemented and started by our April flood season. So, How proud of your team are you? Um, do you feel like they reacted appropriately? Yes. Once the, once the disaster was in play? Yeah. So the team I can speak to is the EOC, uh, fantastic group of people. We have a Boulder multi-agency coordination system that fills this room uh, and, and brings a tremendous capability into uh, our cities and our counties to support. Uh, they carry their, their duties forward into recovery. These are men and women that are not emergency managers. They're not people that do disaster response all day long. Uh, these are folks that are coming from other uh, county city departments. They're coming from nonprofit agencies uh, across the county and they as, did a great job. We were activated And some for of them about probably lost their homes. Some of them did, were affected by it. So we saw that in the flood. So the work that these people do under duress and under harsh conditions is astounding. I'm extremely proud of their efforts to serve the community and the, and the capabilities that we have here at our EOC. Yeah, way to go. Thank you, Mike. You bet. Appreciate Thanks, your time. Yeah.